more years before Christ, a Hindu prince named Gautamon. It was that he be a universal, in him shone the first ages of earlier lives. In Japan, children celebrate his miraculous birth. When he stood on a lotus, I am the first of all men. I am the oldest world. Now I am born for the last time. They pour azalea tea over his image. For legend says that tea fell from the sky when Gautama was born. But behind the legends, there is the life of the Prince Gautama. He grew up, sheltered in his palace, married, and lived in princely. One day he rode out from the palace. He met an old man, weak and wretched, and saw the suffering of old age. All pride of youth left him. He met a lame man and saw the suffering of sickness. All pride in health left him. He saw a dead man and those who mourned him, and seeing the suffering of a world that dies and is reborn, again and again to suffer and die, all pride in life left him. But then he saw a holy man in a yellow robe, full of peace, and seeing him, Gautama decided to seek the way of liberation from the world of pain. That night he rose up, left his wife and sleeping son, and rode from the palace. He renounced his kingdom. He gave away all his worldly goods to his servants and went to the forest to spend years of self-denial and meditation. Then at last Bodhi, enlightenment, came to Gautama the Buddha. He was tempted to escape from the world but turned back in compassion to awaken all men to reality by preaching the Four Noble Truths. All life is suffering. All suffering arises from craving, selfish desire. But if this self, this craving is extinguished, all suffering will cease. This is Nirvana. This is the path of the Buddha, open to all mankind, men or women, of high caste or low. By the third century before Christ, Buddhism was the ruling religion in India. Where he had lived and taught, great monuments called stupas were built. Some of them at Sanchi, some at Bodh Gaya, the place of enlightenment, and at Sarnath, where Buddha preached the word. At Nalanda, 2,000 years ago, pilgrims came from all over Asia to be taught by the monks whose order, founded by Buddha himself, was called Theravada, the teaching of the elders. In India, Buddhism was reabsorbed by Hinduism from which it had come. But to Ceylon were brought its ancient scriptures and traditions. Here, missionaries taught the ideals of charity and compassion. And from Ceylon, Buddhism spread by sea to the islands of Indonesia, where, in Java, the shrines of Borobudur mark the capital of an ancient civilization dedicated to the Tibet Buddha. By land and sea, it spread through the mainland of Southeast Asia, Burma, Thailand, and Cambodia. In central Burma stands a forest of stupas, the holy city of Pagan on the Irrawaddy, built by a Buddhist emperor in the 11th century. A great outpost of Buddhist learning for 200 years, then destroyed by Kublai Khan, it is still a place of devotion and pilgrimage. In the monsoon lands of Ceylon, Burma, and Indochina, Buddhism founded a civilization devoted to universal love and to human perfection. To the hope of nirvana that each man must, like Buddha, find for himself.
in the festivals of Southeast Asia, people honor the Buddha as a symbol of enlightenment and do reverence to the mortal relics of their teacher and example who has gone on into Nirvana. In Burma, Buddhists follow the example of the master in a great ceremony of renunciation. Young boys dressed in princely robes like the Buddha himself reenact his life and are confirmed in the Buddhist community. Buddha taught that there is only one real sacrifice, the sacrifice of our own desires, our own self. The young monk's head is shaved as a sign that he has renounced the world and its pleasures. Giving up family and fortune, he takes refuge in the Buddha, the enlightened one, the teacher and example. He takes refuge in the word, the truth that Buddha himself left to his disciples. And he takes refuge in the Buddhist community, the order of monks. The monk is the ideal of the Theravada Buddhists. He lives in peace and tolerance, in compassion and meditation. Renouncing their possessions, the monks are living examples of unselfishness, pointing the way to Nirvana. By poverty, they are purified. And those who help them are set on the path of righteous living, the path of the Buddha. At some time in his life, every Theravada Buddhist, man or woman, may enter the monastic order. Even as a layman, he follows the Buddha's way of life. Hurt no others with that which pains yourself. And the Buddha said, expect nothing from the merciless gods, for they too are born, grow old, die and are reborn. Alone man is born, alone he lives and alone he dies. You alone must make the effort. The Buddhas of this world are only teachers. All created things perish. He who knows and sees this is at peace, though in a world of pain. This is the way to purity. All forms are unreal. He who knows and sees this is at peace, though in a world of pain. This is the way to purity. The forms and images of the Theravada temples are symbols, symbols of enlightenment, symbols of nirvana, the annihilation of desire. None can save us but ourselves. No one can and no one may. We ourselves must tread the path. Buddhas only show the way. Mahayana Buddhism reached China by 200 AD, carried by missionaries and pilgrims across the wastes of Central Asia. And the court of the Tang Dynasty became filled with converts. Here, Buddhist scholars met the believers of other great religions, Confucians, Taoists, Zoroastrians, Manichaeans, and even Christians. The gospel of Buddhism resulted in a tremendous flowering of Chinese art and literature, some of it preserved in the great cave temples of northern China. But this Buddhism was greatly changed. It was called Mahayana, the great vehicle. In it, the austere figure of Gautama was replaced by a glorious redeemer, Amitabha, the Buddha of infinite light. This same doctrine was carried to Nepal by monks from India. The Indian Buddhists had been greatly influenced by Hindu philosophy, and in the seventh century, their beliefs spread to Tibet, where traditions of magic 
mysticism and yoga have remained up to the present time. It became a country ruled by Buddhist monks called Lamas. Though the popular Buddhism of Tibet was marked by magic and demon worship, the lives of many of the monks are filled with learning and devotion. In the 8th century, the Gospel of Amitabha, the Redeemer, spread from China to Japan. Here in Japan, Mahayana became the supreme religion, tolerating and absorbing the native religion of Shinto, whose gods it called manifestations of the Buddha. For the Buddha now is not the historic Gautama who lived and died ago. He was only one incarnation of the universal Buddha nature that is working in every age, in countless worlds, for the salvation of all living things. The Mahayana scriptures teach that every living thing is a Buddha in the making and that Nirvana is not to be found by conscious thought but by faith and communion in the universal Buddha nature that is in all life and all time. One of the sects, Zen Buddhism, believes that true enlightenment does not come by empty speculation but in a sudden flash of intuition. By strenuous acts of discipline and meditation, the monk seeks an instant of ecstatic vision, of union with the Buddha nature. The Buddha nature manifests itself in many ways, in the teaching of Gautama and in those Buddhas in the making called Bodhisattvas, who in compassion turn back from Nirvana or full Buddhahood to share their merit with suffering humanity. Above all, the Buddha nature dwells in the great Buddhas, the redeemers who can grant the prayer of the believer and carry him into paradise. Some believers, following the example of Gautama and the Bodhisattvas, swear not to pass on into Nirvana until the last blade of grass is set free. It is man's task to bring all life into selflessness. All acts of life are a preparation for Nirvana. In this spirit, even the tea ceremony can become religious ritual for the law of the Buddha inspires love, dignity and grace in every act. Make your life like the lotus, said Buddha, for it rises from mud and mire and yet attains perfect purity. For vast numbers in China, Korea and Japan, the savior and redeemer is Amitabha, the Buddha, lord of the pure land, the western paradise, whose name alone repeated in faith and hope, will bring salvation. To Amitabha they sing the hymn of the White Lotus. His mercy is like the rain that falls on all men. His wisdom like the ocean, deep and boundless. His word is grace, his glance is glory. 
He sends out his smile to the house of suffering. He is the compassionate, the conqueror of desire. It is God himself, enthroned in goodness, who by his law redeems all worlds.